All right, that looks about right. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today we are starting the topic of scholasticism. It's a fun word to say. Um, and it's not just a brand of school supplies. Um, but scholasticism, uh, and this is part one. I was going to try to do it all in one shot, but I figured it'd be better off to do it in two shots. And before I start, just an announcement. We won't have class next Wednesday because I'm going to be at a biblical counseling conference uh, for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I have to be at that. And so, um, yeah, no class next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. Uh, we'll be here for part two of scholasticism. So again, scholasticism part one, um, the subtitle is the rise of the university and the schoolmen. And so what exactly are we talking about? Well, we'll get into that. Uh, the 12th and 13th centuries, which would be the 11 and 1200s, saw a flowering of knowledge and education in Western Christendom, and it reached its height in the 13th century, especially with the the angelic doctor, as they call him, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you may have heard of him. And so the thing is, the, the reason why this flowering of education and really just intellectualism in Europe, the reason it happens is because of the rise of the university. Um, now, we all take universities for granted. Europe didn't have them 900 years ago. I know that sounds like that's a long time ago. But think about it. They did not have them until... Uh, the 11, well, 1000s, 1100s. So the rise of the university system and then the rise of scholasticism, and both of these are related. You can't have one without the other. So we'll talk about the universities first, then we'll talk about scholasticism, and then we'll take a look at some of the scholastic thinkers. Um, so yeah, this one's going to be a little more like, not theoretical, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the last couple lectures were all about war and like, ah, you know, there's movement. Um, this one's about thought. And, and really, we're down to the last 300 years of the class. And so the way it's going to work is I'll cover the intellectual movements for that three, two, 300 years first. Then I'll cover some of the political theological stuff. Um, and then, yeah, we're only about five or six lessons till the end. So we're getting there. Um, but anyway, let's uh, jump into this university system, right? Where did it come from? The Western Europeans learned the university concept from Islamic civilization during the Crusades, particularly the Muslim's oldest university, which still exists today. It's in Cairo, Egypt. It's Al-Azhar Al University in Cairo. It was founded in the year 970. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I remember you in sermons saying that, that Christians came up with the university. Ah, we did. The only Christians in the world aren't in Western Europe. Okay, Western Europe gets the university system from the Muslims. But where did the Muslims get all this learning from? The Byzantines that they conquered. What were the Byzantines? Christians. Okay? So, again, no contradiction there. Going back to West Europe, when the Roman Empire fell in 476, and you have all these Goths come in, and you got this new Gothic order, the Gothic barbarians were not educated. Not like the Romans were, so a lot was lost. The little bit that they had was preserved in the monasteries, um, and they did the best that they could with what they could acquire, but almost all the knowledge was still over in the East. So the Eastern Empire never lost its civilization. It never lost its education. The West did. Now, again, there was some education in the West, but it was, it's in the monasteries and it's in the cathedrals. And I don't know if I ever said this yet, but what is a cathedral? You know, you don't see the word cathedral in the Bible, but when you go to Europe or even some big American cities, you'll have Catholic churches, but then you have this awesome looking building and it's called a cathedral. It comes from the word cathedra, which means seat. Um, and you might say, well, that's a pretty big seat. Well, the idea is a, a church is for a priest to preach to the parish. A cathedral is for a bishop. Remember, you got priests who are the, the minions, but then the, the guy who oversees all the priests for a whole area is called a bishop. That guy gets a cathedral. The cathedral is going to be the biggest. It's going to be like a castle. It's going to be the equivalent of an ancient castle. Um, and that's where a lot of the books, and because books were expensive back then. I mean, you had to handwrite them. That's where the books and the education was going to be. So monasteries and cathedrals. Now, a lot of it was preserved, but nowhere near close to all of it. 
And, you know, the Goths take over, they start to get Christianized and, and civilized, and right when they do, then the Vikings take over. And they were just as barbaric as the Goths originally were. So Western Europe keeps getting these setbacks because barbarians keep invading and taking over, and then they become Christian, then they start to get slightly educated and slightly civilized. Um, and by the time you get to the Crusades, because that's around the same time the Norse really become Christianized, then the Crusaders are going to come in contact with the Muslim universities and the Muslim learning. And I want you to think about this. The Arabs were a nomadic people. Uh, the, the Arabs were a nomadic people um, in Saudi Arabia. Well, we call it Saudi Arabia today. It was the Arabian Peninsula then. They weren't an educated people either. But Muhammad founds Islam. The Muslims go and conquer like Persia, and then they conquer, um, you know, most of the Byzantine Empire. What, is the, what do these guys do? Same thing that the Norse did and the Goths. They eventually absorbed the higher education of the people they conquered. So the reason why the Muslims had such an advanced civilization compared to the Western Christians at this time is because they absorbed all that culture and all that knowledge from the Eastern Empire, Christian Empire, that they conquered. And so they became really good at math, science, philosophy. Um, they were reading and debating the Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. I mean, Muslims were doing this stuff. I know you don't really think about that today, but that was just the, the facts. Um, so they advanced beyond Western Europe. I mean, their technology was better. Their understanding of just about everything was better. But the Crusaders still whooped them <laughs> for a little while. And in, in the process of that, there's going to be some cross-pollinization. Christians are going to learn some things from the Muslims. And it's just, just the way it works. And so this bottom bullet is as the uh, Crusaders in the West came into contact with the greater Islamic intellectual achievement, those ideas are now going to be brought back to Europe. And this is what's going to set the stage for the university system to then come to Europe. So how does this all happen? Formation of the first universities. Um, when this new knowledge first starts coming back through the Crusades and really through fighting Muslims in Spain, that's where that's the easiest way this stuff's going to come into Western Europe. Um, at first, this, this new knowledge is absorbed by the current apparatus. Okay, the, who, who's doing the teaching right now? The cathedrals and the monasteries. So they're the first ones to get this new knowledge, and they're going to be the first ones that start teaching it. And remember, for a, quite some time, free general education was given to boys um, who live in the parish area. Girls were not allowed to be educated back then, uh, but the, the boys were. And so eventually out of the monasteries and out of the cathedrals, especially the cathedral schools more specifically, you're going to get the first university. And if you want to know what the first university in Europe is, it's the Bologna University. Um, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I should have looked it up. I mean, it makes me want to eat a sandwich. But it's in Italy. Okay? It was originally founded in 1890. Um, but at that point, it was a law school. By the time you get to 1155, it becomes a university that doesn't just teach law. It teaches all the main core subjects of that time. And remember that, that tough guy, Fred, Frederick Barbarossa, that I talked about during the Third Crusade, the guy who got old and heavy and drowned in shallow water because he wouldn't take his armor off? Well, when he was young and fit and studly, he, um, he actually sanctioned this. He recognized this as the first university, the University of Bologna. Um, now, the second one is the University of Paris, or Paris, oh, right? Um, and this is going to be probably the premier school of theology in Europe for a very, very long time. Um, and this one came out of Notre Dame, the cathedral. Because remember, education at first was best being done by the cathedrals. You had an, a really top-notch cathedral school out of Notre Dame, and that school is going to turn in to the university. Now, all other universities that start popping up after this are going to model themselves off of either the University of Bologna or Paris. And one thing that, that I need to, to mention is that both types represent a different kind of university. Bologna represented what's called the Universitas Scholorium, or the University of Scholars, and Paris was the Universitas Magistorium, or the University of Masters. And you might say, well, what's the difference? Well, if it's the University of Scholars, the students are in charge, which makes no sense. 
But the students pretty much they're like, we hire you, we fire you, we set the rules, we set everything. We're going to be the ones who determine whether or not you are good enough to teach us. Um, now, for obvious reasons, they had difficulty attracting good teachers. Because if you have all this education, if you've got your PhD or your doctorate, they called it doctorate back then, if you have your doctorate, you don't want a bunch of 15-year-olds telling you, you know, what you should and should not be teaching. Um, but, so I would say the other model, the model of Paris, is going to be a lot better. Um, that's where the teachers are in control. That's why it's called the University of Masters. The teachers set the policies. They set the tuition fees for the students. And so that's what Paris did. And then not surprisingly, in England, Oxford and Cambridge followed the model of Paris. Um, because again, who's going to work for a bunch of teenagers telling you, the expert, what you should be teaching them? It just doesn't make any sense. If that's what was happening when I was a public school teacher, I would have quit. Uh, it's just that simple. It's like, all right, you little punk, you're telling me you don't want to learn about World War II? You know, well, we're going to do World War II. You know, it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense. Now, the, the, just a little bit about the language here. The word university means whole body. So University of Scholars refers to the whole body of students. Scholar actually meant student back then. Today, scholar means expert. So don't get confused by that. When we say University of Scholars for then, we mean University of Students. Um, you know, the whole body of, of students. And then, of course, the University of Masters, the, ma the teachers were called masters. So it's the whole body of masters. So the word university means whole body. And the idea of the university, what, what does una mean? Not bathroom. One, right? It's, it's a unity. That's where we get unity. You have a universe rather than the mythical multiverse that Marvel seems to be pushing. Um, the idea of the university is to bring together all knowledge. You have the sum of total human knowledge with the one ring to rule them all. So all the fields of human learning are to be brought together in a single place where it is taught and communicated. And of course, the one ring to rule it all was the queen of the sciences. Anybody know what the queen of the sciences was? Theology. Back then, because I mean, if you think about it, you look at the university today, it's not a university. You have the anthropology department, the physics department, the chemistry department, the mathematics department, the business department, the um, history department, whatever it might be. They're all their own little universes within there, and they all have their own little deans and, and stuff like that, but there's no, no like one ring to rule them all. They're all kind of equal in their own right. Um, whereas back then it's like, no, there's got to be what's called a gut. I mean, that's what we use today. Um, gut is just grand unifying theory. There has to be a grand unifying theory that brings all knowledge together. Um, modern and postmodern education seems to think there's no grand unifying theory, that it would be arbitrary, everything's just random and separated from each other. But we don't really live that way. And so I think that the, the, in the Middle Ages, their university model is actually what it's supposed to be like. And I think if we went back to that with current levels of learning, um, you would see a lot of awesome stuff. But anyhow, moving on, university uh, specialties. Um, a lot of these universities pop up from 1200 to 1500. By the time you get to 1500, you have over 80 universities in Europe, Western Europe. So it starts, if you think about it, in the 1100s, but it jumps really quickly. 80 universities is a lot. You didn't have 80 universities in the Islamic world or the Chinese world. So once the Europeans get their hands on this, um, it, the idea of it's just going to spread and spread and spread. Um, so in terms of specialties, uh, University of Paris for theology, uh, Bologna for law, Salerno for medicine, Oxford for science and math. Now, you could get an education in everything at these because they're a university. But if you want to like, have the best education for medicine, yeah, you could learn medicine at Oxford back then. But if you want people to say you're cream of the crop for medicine, you go to Salerno. And for theology, yeah, you could learn theology at Salerno. But if you want to be the who's who in theology, then you're going to go to Paris for it. Uh, and, and I think a lot of universities still have that kind of specialization today, where you could get a degree in anything from most universities, but some of them, like, for example, Cal State San Bernardino is known for two things. It's business school and it's, uh, its ability to produce teachers, its teacher credential program. Um, that's what it's known for. There's going to be other, uh, now you could get a degree in anything there, but if you, I mean, what they're known for are those two that I mentioned. Now, 
Yeah, but as I said, any developed university is going to have four departments of faculty because really you couldn't get degrees in like agricultural farming or, you know, I don't know, uh, um, feminine studies of Asian women under 20 in America. You know, you don't get a PhD in that stuff back then. It's just not the way it worked. There were four departments. You had theology, law, medicine, or the arts. That's what you got a degree in. Um, you didn't have all these, these other things where all these people run up $100,000 in student loans and then they can't get a job because the degree is so specialized and so meaningless to the rest of us that, you know, you get what I'm saying? Somebody's going to spend, you know, so much money on, you know, an underwater basket weaving degree, <laughs> you know, and then they expect somebody just to hire them. It's like, well, that's not the way it works. So back then... The things you got degrees in were the things that society actually needed. Um, now, the normal age for entering the university, believe it or not, was 14 or 15 years old. Today, it's 18 years old. The 14-year-old back then had the mental abilities of probably a 28-year-old now. Um, they were just a lot more mature and a lot smarter if they could go to these schools. Uh, again, women were not eligible for university education at this time. Now, what was the prerequisite if you were a lad that wanted to go to school? Well, you had to be able to speak and read Latin fluently. That was the first one. And then the second one is you got to be able to afford it. <laughs> Those are the only two prerequisites. I don't care how smart you are. If you got no money, you're not coming to my school. <laughs> That's the first thing. you got, you got to pay for it. Um, and they didn't have massive student loan programs back then, so you had to likely come from a rich family, um, and you had to be able to speak Latin. Now, this Latin aspect of it is, is fascinating to me because think of Europe. Europe's pretty big. you got all these countries different nationalities, a whole bunch of languages. But because every university only taught in Latin, you could be a boy from England and you could go to Italy and you're going to learn this. You're going to be speaking the same language in that university as they're speaking back in the English ones and the French ones and the German ones. All the universities are speaking Latin. So this gave you the mobility to move anywhere in Europe and learn at any school you want. So if you want to get out of your hometown and say, I want to experience Germany, I want to eat them Bratwursts and say, yeah, and nine, you know, and stuff like that, then, then pretty much, you know, pretty much you could do that. You could do that even if you were, let's say, from France and your native language was French, but all the instructions in Latin. Everybody's able to talk to each other in Latin. And by the way, these pictures here, um, I wanted to call your attention to it. These are those three oldest universities. Here you have the University of Paris at the top, Bologna in the middle, and then Oxford at the bottom. They're just magnificent looking schools. Pastor Brian got, well, Brian, sorry, he got to go and uh, spend a lot of time at Oxford and play around in their library and stuff like that. I mean, I'm so jealous, and the pictures uh, are so cool. Just one day, I just want to loiter there until they kick me out and say, get out of here, bum. Um, it's just, I mean, it's ancient. It, it's magnificent looking. But anyhow, um, they all speak Latin, as I said. But when you get to the school, they do segregate you by nationality. So all the instructions in Latin, but if you're an English boy in a French school, all the English kids are roomed together and they form their own student body. All the French kids form a student body, all the German kids, all the Italian kids. It's kind of like Harry Potter again, um, where you have the school and you have the little segregated groups within it. They all speak the, the wizard language or whatever you call it. You know, they, they speak that, but then they all have their own little subcultures. And it's going to be the same thing there. And of course, I, I think you guys know how human nature is. In the early universities, there's going to be fist fights, duels, all sorts of things. Yeah, in class, they'll be arguing in Latin, but then they'll be making fun of each other in German or French and be like, hey, can you, you put up your white flag, Frenchie. And they're like, this means war. <laughs> you know, and so stuff would just happen, right? Uh, but anyhow, I don't want to go on that rabbit trail. Um, so each body, so you got the German body, the French body, and so forth, each one was presided over by a university officer called a proctor. And then all the proctors would elect a rector, a single rector that kind of runs things for all the departments. And then each department's faculty was governed by a dean. Now, I, I say all that because um, if you've been to university now, you got deans. You, you got all these positions that are still there. Where did this all come from? came from here. So this stuff's actually uh, pretty old. Now, what was the method of the educators um, in these universities? It's kind of, 
I think we should go back to some of this. Let's put, well, I don't think our young kids could handle it, but the college kids should be able to handle this stuff, little punks. Okay, so as far as the teachers go, they were usually clergy, regardless of the subject. It was likely a priest or a bishop teaching you math or science uh, or whatever, or medicine. Um, uh, there were a few layman teachers, though, but they had to be celibate. So they had to live like they were a priest. And the students had to be celibate. You had to be unmarried when you were in school. Now, given that you're starting at 14, I don't think that's going to be a problem. You know, some of them's voice was still cracking, and so um, that wasn't going to be the, 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 big, the big problem there. The academic year, this would drive our kids crazy. Their school year was not nine months. It was 11 months. They only got a couple weeks off for Christmas and Easter, and that was it. Um, and how the education was given to you was by two means, the lecture and the disputation. The lecture is the easy one. It's what I'm doing right now. Um, but it was a little more formal then. The way the lecture would work is the teacher would have a book that you're studying, a text. And keep in mind, you weren't able to go on Amazon and get textbooks. The book, you probably didn't even own it because, again, they were so hard to come by. They had to be handwritten. The university probably owned the books and had them locked up um, in the library. And the professor has access to it, and he's reading. And this, he's reading it, and the students take very detailed notes of what he's reading. And then he gives the interpretation. This is what it means. So he starts teaching from it. And again, the students had to take very detailed notes because they were expected to be able to remember what was taught to them. And they needed that because if they were ever going to try to recall this information, they didn't have access to the books. Um, you know, you, you had... <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking of these dumb things, but like in that, that one movie, um, Doctor Strange, he had to get by Wong to steal the secret books. You know, um, it, it's the same type of thing. You, not everybody had access to all this stuff. Now, the disputation form of teaching is a whole nother level. This would be where a teacher and a student, so let's say the teacher picks a student, it's like, Albert, you're up next, and we're going to set out to solve a problem, but this is all on you. So what the teacher does is he takes two statements that seem to contradict each other, but both statements are found in authoritative text. Okay, so it's not like, you know, you're quoting, you know, Islam that says God can't have a son and Christianity that says God has, that's easy. Islam's wrong, Christianity's right. No, they're going to Christian sources that are both considered authoritative. For example, one church father says God can't die. And then another church father says God died on the cross. So the professor gives the student these two seeming con contradictory, these conflicting statements. And then the student would be required to give all the arguments for and against each statement. So you'd say, first let me pretend I'm on the side that God can't die at all. He gives all the arguments for it. God's uh, incorporeal, he's spirit, he's not physical, he's eternal, you know, all that stuff. He's making those arguments and he has to give all the Bible verses to support it. But then he has to say, all right, now I'm on the other side. God can die because in Christ, God added humanity to himself and humans can die, you know. And so, you know, he, he has to give all the, the arguments for that. The teacher would then make comments, okay, you were good here, you were horrible there, um, I don't even know why you're in this school. You need to drop out or, hey, you, you might be the future, you know, and then he would offer a solution to the problem. And, if the, and that's if the student didn't come up with a, um, a, strong, a, a strong answer himself. But, you know, the professor in this case would say both statements are true if interpreted properly. God's divine nature can't die, but when God became a man, he added human nature to himself, um, which can die. But the divinity still remains incapable of dying, right? And it's because of the hypostatic union of Jesus, the two natures, divine and human, subsisting in the one person, that's why this isn't a contradiction. Um, so that would be explained. But there's a lot of work that goes into a disputation, and all the other kids are watching you, you know? And, and again, everybody's want, everybody wants to be the top guy in the class. Everybody wants to be the Harry Potter. And the people who aren't the Harry Potter are jealous of the Harry Potter, um, you know? And, and, and so that, that's kind of how, how it works. And so if you slip up there, and one person gets to raise their hand and pick apart your entire argument, and then everybody starts, like, you know, giggling, you're like, man. And again, that's where sometimes these duels would happen. Um, but this was a very, very 
effective method of training students in logic, argumentation, and sound thinking. It enabled them to be proficient on any subject for which they had to do a disputation. Now, I tried this kind of stuff when I was a high school teacher where it was called philosophical chairs and I'd put a controversial statement up like, um, the U.S. was right in dropping the two atomic bombs on Japan. And I'd say, if you agree with this statement, stand on this side of the room. If you disagree, stand on that side of the room. And then each side has one person come forward and try to make a good argument. And if it's convincing, people on the other side could switch. And I could tell you, after five or six years of doing it, these kids were so incredibly stupid. Stupid. I'm sorry. Their arguments were so emotive. There was no, like, man, it's just wrong because, you know, that just ain't cool, man. Mushroom cloud and, you know, uh, I, I'm pretty sure there was radiation. There, there, there could have been another way, man. And then the other side is like, nah, man, they attacked us at Pearl Harbor. This was revenge, you know. And then people are just going back and forth, and I'm looking at them. I'm like, you were persuaded by that? And sometimes the person who's the loudest, most emotional and pointing and yelling and interrupting, everybody's scared of them, and they go to their side. So I'm thinking, like, the youth of today are incapable of this, but if we could get them back to this, oh my gosh, this would be such a good, good learning method. I think uh, in college, this should be um, mandatory. Now, sometimes the leaders would jump into the disputation uh, game, and what they would do is they'd say, hey, I'm going to introduce the debate. I'm going to give the two statements. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to give the theses, and I challenge any of you to debate me. And so this is like the 15-year-old's chance. Man, I'm just a kid. This guy's got his doctorate. If I beat him, I'm the new Harry Potter, you know. But of course, if you try, he's probably going to crush you. I mean, you're 15. This guy is probably 50, 60, knows a lot more than you. But sometimes the kids would take the challenge and occasionally the genius ones would win. Um, I think Peter Alvillard is a, is, is a good example of that. And I'll be talking about him uh, later. But, you know, even the professors had to put themselves on the line. If you could beat me, hey, props to you. Um, and I'd say the topic that was most debated was transubstantiation, which, you know, that's the Catholic idea that um, the elements of communion really, in some sense, are the blood and body of Jesus. We'll be talking more about that in the next scholasticism lesson, not this one. Now, let's say you uh, finish. What is the degree you would get? Huh. Well, you were awarded a bachelor degree. Wonder where we got that from, right? So if you get a bachelor degree, you are in an ancient tradition. And when you wear your silly little cloak and you're walking, so did they back then. And the people who got master's degrees had more powerful cloaks, as if they were a Sith Lord or a Jedi. And the people who had the doctorate, man, they wore cloaks like they were wizards. And if you look at the universities today, it is the same thing. I'm always impressed when I see the PhD guys at graduations walking with their very colorful gowns and their funny looking hats. Like it's a combination of wizardry, uh, Pillsbury Doughboy, you know, all these things put together. I'm like, huh, but one day I'll get my doctorate and then I too will walk around looking weird like that. But anyhow, but the first thing was the bachelor degree. Now the curriculum at its core was called liberal arts. Now, why is it called arts? It's not called liberal because of liberalism. It's, it's liberal because it covers all the main subjects. And then the reason it's plural is because there were seven arts. And some people are trying to bring this back. And I, I'll throw this out there for people who might be interested. The Master's University, as far as I know, is the only school that's tried to bring back an opportunity to give somebody a degree in a bachelor degree in classic, uh, classic education, and so it's it would be the seven liberal arts. Now, if you go to a Cal State or a UC or, or whatever it might be. Um, you could get a liberal arts degree, but all that means is they're going to make you take a little bit of math, a little bit of history, a little bit of science, a little bit of everything. That way you could teach sixth graders and below. That's what a liberal arts degree is now. That is not what a liberal arts degree was back then. Back then, it was split into two systems, two halves, the trivium and the quadrivium. Uh, the trivium, which is called the three ways... Uh, was comprised of the study of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And keep in mind, it's not just three classes. You're not taking a grammar class, a logic class, or a rhetoric class. You're taking a lot of grammar classes, a lot of rhetoric classes, a lot of logic classes. Grammar is just how language works. Rhetoric is public speaking and how to persuade people and how to shoot down arguments and stuff like that. It's the whole uh, Aristotle's uh, ethos, pat, uh, pathos, um, and logos. 
which is focusing on, on emotions, the intellect, all that kind of stuff. Now, once you've completed the trivium and you're halfway done, now you move to the quadrivium, which is the four ways. And, uh, and bless you. And that is where you're getting into like the hard sciences, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Once you're done with all of this, then you would be awarded a degree. How long would it take to get a bachelor degree? About six years. Six years with 11 months, 11 month school years. Uh, a lot more, a lot, a lot more hardcore uh, than it is today. Now, you might say, all right, six years, I'm now 20, but I want more than there, there are other degrees, master's and doctorate. And depending on which route you want to take, it's 14 years. Um, that's why I'm saying these guys knew a lot of stuff. And if you're going to be a lecturer, you have to have either a master's or a doctoral degree. Now, you can't get, today you could get master's in almost anything. Um, so underwater basket weaving, once you got your bachelor degree, you could say, well, I want to under, I want to, you know, weave baskets underwater at a master degree level. And they'll take your money and they'll award you the degree. Back then, you could only go for a higher degree in the subjects of theology, law, and medicine. Those were the only three. Those were the only three. Um, and if you were a doctor, you were considered an expert. Now, what's the result of having universities like this? Well, it revolutionized theology in Western Europe. Remember, before this, it was the monasteries that gave the learning. The leading theologians were the monks. All their study was in the setting of the monastery. It was focused on the practical side of ministry, which is not a bad thing. Um, but the university is going to change this. It's going to challenge it. See, theology now becomes an intellectual subject rather than a practical subject. It was always intellectual, but it was always with the goal of how does it change your life. Now it becomes intellectual just because, well, what's the most important thing we could possibly know about? God. And just like math doesn't necessarily change your life and knowing music doesn't necessarily change your life, well, they're thinking knowing all the details about God that you can doesn't necessarily change your life either. And I'd say that's a negative. There, there's a lot of people with PhDs in theology that are not good people. Um, and and that, that kind of thing started here. Uh, people are now studying outside of the ecclesiastical or church context, and they're studying in the university. Uh, now, the benefit, at least in terms of being able to grow in knowledge, though, is that you could do the studying without the rules and the disciplines of the monasteries. Remember, monasteries, you have to work, you have to produce your own food, or if, it's a, if you're a mendicant monk, you have to go begging for food, you have to do all these good works. The university, your only job is homework, studying, reading, all day long, right? So you're able to dedicate more time to learning. In the early universities, um, <laughs> the recreational time often included uh, recess, drunken brawls, the killing of each other. Um, some kids would walk around with swords because they know like, hey, I made this guy mad from Germany. I think he's coming after me, so I'm ready. You know, at, at first some parents are like, I'm not sending my kid to the university. Eventually things calm down and you don't have that as bad. But that's an ancient uh, painting. Well, yeah, I guess you could say back then still ancient, of somebody getting shanked in the context of school. So it wasn't just the Crips and the Bloods doing this stuff, you know, in, in you know, South Central Los Angeles. This stuff was happening in the University of Paris, you know, like you made fun of my mama or whatever. So, I mean, they, they, you know, the type of violence happened then as well. Now, the great theologians, uh, uh, the, one of the results of this is they're no longer the monks, but they're the professors and they make their living by teaching. So the better they are at teaching, the more they could demand from their students. If you're a monk, hey, you could stay a mediocre teacher your whole life. You're, you're a monk. You're not going anywhere. But, uh, but you have an incentive in the universities to be good at what you do. And this ends up freeing Western theology from church control. And it fostered intellectual energy, debate, and really good writing. Uh, it also encouraged free academic discourse, uh, questions that used to not be allowed to be asked, can now be asked and debated. Now, what I will say is even with that, they were still loyal to the church, still loyal to Christian theology. It's just some things in the context of the church will never be asked. Now they can be asked in the universities. It worked fine during this time, but once you get to the Enlightenment, the same principle is going to be used to really just try to uh, 
throw Christianity out of society. It's, and, and that's we're now living in the effects of that. So on the negative side, this divided intellectual and theological pursuits from each other, and they should have never been divided. Um, so that's all the university stuff. Now I move to the second thing that's related to it, scholasticism. Technical sounding word, but this is just what historians use to describe the teaching that dominated the universities in the Middle Ages. The word scholastic comes from the word school, um, and it just means school theology. It is the theology not of the church, but the theology of the schools. So again, scholastic professors were schoolmen. I think I said school five different times, just so you'd understand scholastic school. That's, that's, that's where this teaching's happening. Now, these schoolmen developed a distinctive approach to theology, and the next few slides will summarize it. Uh, first, they were very, very concerned about the relationship between faith and reason. Uh, they wanted to see first, okay, how far can we get to the truth with just reason? Pure reason, not going to the Bible. Let's see what we could discover. Let's see if we could prove the doctrines of the Christian faith without the aid of the Bible. That was what, and, and that's where natural theology really gets its start. And so then the question was, well, what if we have a doctrine that can't be shown by pure reason? Um, what do we do with it? So it's like, well, reason can't prove the Trinity. So do we throw the Trinity out or do we throw reason out? That's what they have to, to debate. And then others would say, well, maybe we can't prove it with reason, but we could show it's still in harmony with reason. And again, the Trinity is the example. You're not going to be able to prove the Trinity with pure reason, but you can use reason in like the one and many problem of philosophy to show that the Trinity actually makes a lot of sense in terms of reason. So that, that would be an example right there. Um, they also debated whether or not something might be false. Meaning the question is this, could reason convince us something's true? But then the Bible contradicts that, so then it can't be true even though reason says it's true. You know, and different schoolmen will give different answers. Some will say that's impossible. You will never have a situation where reason will actually truly point to something different than the Bible. Others will say, yeah, you will, but that's where God's knowledge is higher than our knowledge. Therefore, we, we cast ours aside for his. And then you'll have others that'll say, well, maybe that's a problem in the divine revelation. And we should listen to reason instead, which, again, not too many people would say that. By the time you get to the Enlightenment, that's what everybody's saying. So, um, so yeah, different schoolmen give different answers on that. Now, their approach to theology, they wanted to offer a complete and systematic account of the Christian truth. That had not been done before. So I, I taught a 116-lecture systematic theology class that's on Sermon Audio. If you ever wanted to go through it, if you listen to one per week, it'll take you like two years and a couple months. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> the whole idea of systematic theology was invented by the scholastics. Uh, and so what systematic theology is, it's each doctrine has to be examined logically from every point of view, biblical, logical, and historical. And so the idea would be like, okay, what are the various things the Bible talks about? It talks about God, so we got to have a doctrine of God. It talks about Christ. So we have to have a doctrine of Christ. It talks about angels. So we have to have a doctrine of the angels. And then the idea is let's look at everything the Bible says about God, everything the Bible says about Christ, everything the Bible says about angels. Okay, and you write a lot on each subject. And then you say, okay, now let's see what we could say about these from reason or logic. And now let's see what the church fathers have said about it, historical. And then once you've done that, you've created a theology of each of those. And it's been systematic. Well, then you have to combine them all together in a single book called a summa. And so you may be familiar with some of the medieval books like uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas' most famous work, uh, Summa Theologica. Um, the word summa just means summary. And you might think, aren't summaries short? No, not for them. The summary is taking all these, all this work and putting it together in a single, single volume or multi-volumes, but it's, a, it's considered a single work. So really what you see here is you see a quest for a universal system of doctrine 
Um, and they exerted great effort on questions today that most Christians think are silly. So you may have heard that they were so dumb they used to argue how many angels could fit on the, 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 the point of a needle. You know, and they would literally argue and like, you know, you're an idiot if you think it's any less than 100,000, you know. Uh, they, they would just be going back and forth on this. Now we think, what a meaningless thing to talk about. But not to them because they're saying, hold on. We're asking and answering questions about everything. If angels are spirit and incorporeal, then they're not, they're not contained in the same way we are by matter. So the rules would be different. And so based on what we could deduce logically from the rules of what it would be like if you're not constrained by the three dimensions, how many could fit on the point of a pin? You know, like you'd be like, but the point of a pin so small. You're like, yes, to you. Because you're a, a, a material being that's a lot bigger than, than the, the point of a needle. But if you're a spiritual being, you could fill a space way bigger than us to where we're as small as a pin, or you could shrink yourself down to where the pin's as big as the earth itself. You know? And so they really start getting into all this theoretical stuff, and they'll argue about it. And a lot of people think it's useless. But I got to say, I mean, these were the nerds I would have wanted to hang around during that time. Um, and it, to me, it's, it's fun questions. Can an angel be in two places at the same time? Could have God become incarnate as a woman to where we have the daughter of God? Could have he been an animal, the dog that died for our sins, you know, Fido? And of course, so, so they start asking these and, and saying, well, no, he had to be a son because he's the eternal son. Um, you know, dogs aren't made in the image of God. But these are questions that most Christians today would never think to ask. They asked and they came up with the answers. Who sinned more, Adam or Eve? Well, obviously Eve. No, I mean, the, you know, the fall came through Adam. Um, so, but they would debate this. And I'm sure most would land on, on Adam. Now, the third thing is they're answering questions besides just church teaching. Um, they're real philosophers. Uh, so what is matter? What is mind? What is time? What is space? What is being? What is the nature of cause and effect? These are all the things people still argue about today. And the whole reason the enlightenment happens is not because they didn't ask these questions. They asked these same questions but just gave different answers, opposite answers, to be quite honest. Um, but, but anyhow, um, one of the big debates, and this might seem, I'm going to try to explain this in the easiest way possible, which isn't easy because this is uh, some somewhat complicated, deep, philosophical reasoning, but the big debate was between realism and nominalism. And I think this is still a big debate today. And I remember I was talking to my uh, small group on, uh, you know, when I was teaching them about evangelism and I was mentioning to them how years ago we went to the mission inn to evangelize. And I was on my high horse. I just defeated in a public online debate, a very uh, well-known atheist who was part of the Atheist Experience TV show. He quit halfway during the debate. I'm like, dude, I took down one of their big shots. And so we go to the, the uh, mission in, and I'm like, here's some atheists there. I'm like, well, if I took out the big gun, <laughs> who's this nobody? But this nobody brought up something I never heard before, and it kind of like shook me a little bit. I didn't let him see. I had my poker face on and acted like, that's the stupidest objection I've ever heard, and I gave him something else to then, you know, make him think, but the whole time I was driving home, I'm like, how do I answer that? Um, and I remember Rachel's like nine years old, and she wouldn't stop talking my head off She was because she went there as well, so I'm having to have a conversation with her and myself in my head at the same time, and I just bring that all up. The debate I was having with myself and with that guy was realism versus nominalism. So these things still, um, still hold sway today. Uh, it's either going to be realism or nominalism or something in between. So let me try to explain what this is. These are two ways of answering what is the relationship between an individual thing like a fish and what makes that the same as other things that we would call fish. Meaning you got like a swordfish and you got trout. They're very different, but we still call them both fish. Okay, so what is the relationship between the individual and the, the universal category? So the general idea, the universal, is called fishness. Well, that's what we'd call it. What does it mean to be a fish, right? Um, so fishness. The realists were like Plato. They followed in the footsteps of Plato. And remember I talked about Plato like 
four months ago. I know you don't forget anything in four months. Um, but Plato was the one who said that you have this world of forms, like chairs and people, but this isn't true reality. True reality or real reality is a world of ideas, a world of universals. There's a spiritual world not made of matter where the perfect idea of the chair exists and the perfect idea of humanity exists and the perfect idea of trees and fish and exists. And then what we have down here are material copies of that idea. And the reason why we're different is from each other is we're made out of matter, we're flawed, there's errors, there's mistakes. But for the most part, he would say fundamental reality, real reality is that spiritual idea of humanness or dogness, not the individual dogs that you'll find in nature. Okay, so again, humanity, he would say, as a concept is more real than the individual human because even if all of us get obliterated, the concept would still exist. I mean, I guess if there were people to think about it, right? Um, now, nominalists were different. They were influenced by Plato's student and his uh, backstabber. I mean, not, he didn't really backstab him in a moral way, but Aristotle broke from his teacher and said, Plato's wrong. And Aristotle then posed what was called nominalism. And nominalism is the idea that, no, the individual things are what are real. Okay, so how do I know what the universal concept of dogness is? Only by looking at real dogs. Without looking at real dogs, you can't know dogness in a sense. So it's not the, this ethereal concept that's reality. It's the real thing in front of me. It's chairs. And then that's from the chairs, the individual chairs. We as humans will come up with the concept and we will name the concept. That's why it's called nominalism because in Latin name is uh, nomen, right? Or namos in Greek, but nomen, no, namos in Greek is law. What am I talking about? But nomen is, is, uh, is Latin. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I have it up here somewhere. Yeah, nomen, nomen, excuse me as in nomenclature and stuff like that. So, uh, so the idea of nominalism is, no, we study the individual things. That's what's real. And then we give a name to a concept that may or may not be real. But we call it that because we give it the name. So again, the realists are like, no, the concept's real. You know, it's the most real thing. The nominalists are like, no, the individual things are the most real thing. And I know that seems kind of uh, abstract, but I'm telling you, you cannot do philosophy without an answer on this. You just can't. Plato and Aristotle really boiled down the only two possibilities for us. Now, again, there's going to be a lot of people that try to offer positions as a via media between pure realism and nominalism. And I, I know Pat, uh, Brian's uh, historical theology lectures, in the first few lectures, he started talking about Christian Platonism. And I think he gave a really good explanation of why it's going to be realism. But, but here's the thing. Realism can only work if God exists. If God doesn't exist, then it would be nominalism. But then how could you account for existence if there's no God? So, again, very important stuff. Now, that's not to say that nominalists are not Christians. A lot of the people like Thomas Aquinas and those guys are going to really like Aristotle. And they're going to absorb a lot of nominalism. Uh, now, so very few of them were pure nominalists. Some were. But a pure nominalist would say then, if, if you go back to what I said, divinity itself isn't the concept. That's not real, the concept. You have to find individual divine things. And what are the individual divine things? There's three of them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so they would say, based on those three, we now have the concept of divine. Where the realist would say, no, divinity is the essence. And then from that essence, we find three individual particular particular uh, persons. Again, the realist would be right on that. The nominalist, if you follow their thinking to its conclusion, the Trinity ends up being three different gods. So just to give you an example, John Wycliffe, he was a pure realist. William of Ockham was a fierce nominalist. I'll talk about William next time. And Thomas Aquinas tried to be both. He tried to have it both ways. So realism versus nominalism, that was the big argument of that time. Now, I do have to, to bring up Aristotle's relationship to this all because most of Western Europeans' history, they really only knew about Plato. They were all realists until scholasticism. In the 13th century, scholastic theology is going to start re relying increasingly on Aristotle. Now, 
I, when I said he was unknown, I was exaggerating. He was known through the writings of Bothius of the 6th century. Um, Bothius, once the Roman Empire was falling, he tried to, you know, preserve some of that ancient Greco-Roman philosophical knowledge, and he wrote some of it down, and he did copy some of Aristotle's works, but not a lot, not a lot. So he was only known this much, whereas Plato, we, we, they had just about everything from Plato. The rest of Aristotle's writings don't become available until the Crusades. They become available in the 1100s, uh, mainly through two Muslim philosophers, Avicenna, who lived from 980 to uh, uh, 1037, he was a Persian, and then the more important one, Averroes, who lived from 1126 to 1198, he was from Spain, and remember, Spain is right there in Europe, so this is the easiest way to access it. Now, what these Arabs did, or what these Muslims did, is they translated the Greek to Arabic, and then they added their commentaries to it. Well, then Christian scholars got their hands on the Arabic and translated it from Arabic back into Latin. And so it was like a translation of a translation of a translation. And they also took the Muslim commentaries and translated them as well, and accepted a lot of what was in those commentaries. So it was through Muslim Spain that they find their way back into Europe. Now, after a couple generations, later scholars are going to be like, let's just get our hands on the Greek. We know Greek. <laughs> we could get Arist all these works in, from Aristotle in the Greek from the Middle East. That's where they are. And we could translate them directly to Latin. So eventually they will. Now, the rediscovery of Aristotle has a massive, massive impact on Western thought. And just to, to state it quickly and bluntly, um, they believe Aristotle provided an interpretation of God, humanity, and the world that was logical, persuasive, and comprehensive, and he did it without referencing the Bible because he didn't have the Bible. Um, Aristotle is the one that gives us the argument that there has to be only one God, and you could reason back to God by looking at the real world. Um, he, he would say that, okay, well, I'm here. Where'd I come from? My parents. Where'd they come from? Their parents. Where'd they come from? Their parents. And then, well, where'd they come from? It doesn't matter what you answer from there. Uh, they had to come from something. In, the, in other words, everything in the universe is in movement. One thing causes the movement of the next thing, the next thing. So you keep going back. He says, eventually, you have to get to an unmovable mover. The one that starts it all that has to be different and eternal and not constrained by this. And he's 100% right on all that. And he figured that out apart from, from divine revelation. He just figured that out through philosophy. Thomas Aquinas is going to take that and put a, a Christian spin on it. It's going to be a really strong argument. We call it the cosmological argument for the existence of God. But Aristotle's the, the real first thinker on that. Um, so again, once Aristotle gets rediscovered, these guys really like him. Unfortunately, though, some of them get so enthu enthusiastic for him that they accepted and taught even the things he said that were anti-Christian, um, that would contradict their faith. For example, Aristotle taught that the universe itself is eternal. The Bible says in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And, and some of them even taught that our human souls are not immortal because Aristotle said they're not immortal. Instead, Aristotle says when you die, your soul becomes one with the universe. That's paganism. You know, that's Hinduism. That's a, lo a lot of things. Um, and so some Christian theologians started teaching this because they're putting Aristotle even above the Bible. Now, again, not all of them were doing that, but some were, and that's a problem. And so the church rightly condemned this as heresy. Uh, and by the way, these guys were called avarists. Um, because again, they, uh, where were they learning about Aristotle? From, uh, from Averroes' commentary. And they were accepting some of what he said. And so when they start being called he uh, heretics, some of them try to come up with this, uh, this little like, workaround where they say, okay, well, well, we believe in a theory of double truth. And the idea of double truth is that human reason, when not corrected by divine revelation, will compel philosophers to believe things that are true that are not true, um, and then divine revelation might come and later expose it. So they're, they're, they'd say, we don't have to throw Aristotle out. We could keep him because a lot of what he says is true, but his reason led him to things that aren't true, and the Bible just corrects those things, but we could, we could keep the rest. Um, but the problem is this theory sets reason and faith in conflict as if reason and faith don't agree with each other, as if reason takes you so far, but faith, which is mystical, takes you the rest of the way. And honestly, faith and reason should go together. They shouldn't be in conflict with each other ever. Um, and so again, 
in the Middle Ages, not too big of a consequence. When you get to the Enlightenment, big consequence. They're going to throw faith out and say all we need is reason. Um, now, when Aristotle first comes back into Europe, most Catholic theologians opposed him. They thought he was dangerous because of the avarists, and they were committed Platonists. But Aristotle's going to win the day. He just is. Um, it's just, just the way it works. Now, again, Plato versus Aristotle, and some of the scholastics will even argue who was the better Christian, Plato or Aristotle, which is the dumbest thing because neither were Christians. They were pagan Greeks. But again, their philosophy was useful to helping Christians articulate Christian doctrine. That's why they were trying to, in a sense, baptize them. Um, but Platonism, remember, it helped the church articulate the great tradition of the Trinity, the hypostatic union. It was using Platonic language. And Augustine, he was a Platonist, and most people still followed in the footsteps of Augustine. Aristotle, he disagreed with a lot of Plato's main ideas. And remember, a lot of this will be reviewed from what I said in like the second lecture in the intertestamental period. Plato claimed that the human soul had innate knowledge of that word world of forms. That's why we could discern chairs and fish and all that, because we're just born, since we, in a sense, come from there, we're born knowing about this, this real, invisible, immaterial world. It doesn't depend on our experience. You can understand dogness without ever experiencing a dog. And things like beauty, justice, they're just intuited by our inner knowledge. Aristotle's like, no, you're wrong, teacher, because he was his teacher. He's like, all human knowledge comes from our experience. That's how we know what these things are. And then our physical senses mediate this experience to our soul. Um, and so, he's, so again, Aristotle would say we can know God exists just by looking at the real world. I didn't make myself. I came from something that came from something that came from something. Eventually, we get back to the something that comes from nothing. Um, he said you could figure that out through experience. Plato would be like, no, we intuit that there's one God, you know, because there has to be, you know, source. They're both saying this sort of the same thing, but how they get there is different. Um, now, traditional Catholics, when Aristotle first comes into Europe, they suppress him for a while. But when you get to the 1200s, it, it, it switched. Aristotle was now the favored guy. And the scholastics proclaimed him as he was the great pagan forerunner that God sent into the world to prepare the world for Jesus. Which again, no, Moses and the prophets prepare the world, the world for Jesus, not Aristotle. I, I absolutely hate that kind of argument. And it's, it's being remade again by theologians today. Aristotle did not prepare the world for Christ. He just didn't. Um, special revelation did. Prophecy did and all that kind of stuff. But, but anyhow, um, the upheavals that Aristotle caused in Europe, just want to point out real quickly, this did not have an equivalent in the Eastern Church because to the Byzantine Christians, Aristotle was never lost. They had them the whole time. A long time ago, they figured out how to marry him and Plato with the church doctrine. They're like, yeah, we put this together a long time ago. So they had no scholasticism. But in Western Europe, this was absolutely revolutionary. Like, who's this Aristotle? Where's he been all of our life? You know, how do we work him together with Plato? Eventually, Aquinas does that. He, he will put them together. Um, I just really quickly want to tell you, like, it, it, Aristotle is helpful. Okay? I'm critical of him in some ways, but I like him in other ways. Aristotle is very helpful in because he really sat down and thought about it. Like, how do you know things? And again, he's a little different than Plato. Plato would say, you just do because you intuit it. Aristotle would be like, no, there's five ways of knowing. The first way is intelligentia uh, in Latin. It's, it's nous in Greek. This is just, you just know it because it's self-evident. He's like, there are some things that need no demonstration. For example, I exist. I don't have to demonstrate that to myself. The fact that I'm even talking to myself right now proves I exist. I don't have to prove I exist. So there's just some things. I like food. I don't have to demonstrate that, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's some things that don't need demonstration. You just know it. That's noose. That's intelligentia. But there's some things that need to be demonstrated. And that's called scientia. And that's where we get the word science. It just means knowledge. And, uh, and of course, for, in Greek, episteme. That's where we get the word knowledge, epistemology, right? 
Um, so this needs to be demonstrated. You have to prove your conclusions with evidence. It's not, so there are some things you just know. There's some things we think, but we have to prove. And then sapentia or Sophia is wisdom. This is the type of knowing like, what do I do? How do I apply what I know to where I live a wise life? And then you have prudentia, uh, which in the Greek is uh, phronesis, which is prudence. This has to do with, uh, with things that are done. Like what is the smart thing to do? It's to invest money. It's to save. It's not to go into debt. Those are things of prudence. It's you discipline your kids young, teach them to read, you know, stuff like that. And then of course, <laughs> this <laughs> arse, um, which, you know, never mind, arse or, uh, or taking, uh, it's art. And so this is a different way of knowing. This is like, how do we create? We learn things by creating things um, and stuff like that. So he's saying these are the five ways of knowing. Each one uses different parts of your, your, your overall thinking abilities. But what you want to do to be a complete person is to take whatever you're learning, whatever it is, and first state the first principles. What do you know without proof? And then what do you have to prove? And then how, uh, you know, how do you be wise with this? And then what specific concrete things can you do? And then could you express it creatively? If you could do all five ways of thinking on any typical thing, then you're actually, you're doing a lot of heavy processing and thinking with that is all. All right, so now what I wanna do, man, I didn't think this lesson was gonna take as long as it did. Um, but I'm going to try to um, just go through three scholastic thinkers because the next time I'm going to go through the rest of them and the rest of them are, there's a lot more to say about them. So you may have heard of Anselm of Canterbury. Um, and Anselm, he technically was writing before the university came into existence, but he's still considered the first scholastic. He's one of the greatest thinkers in the history of Christianity. His life dates 1033 to 1109. So this is like, he's an old man when the crusades were starting. Um, so pretty much he was, he, he was born in Italy. He served as an abbot in France. He eventually becomes the highest church man in England, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He spent a lot of his time arguing with two English kings during the great investiture, investiture controversy. I didn't mention that controversy, but in short, it's this. Various European monarchs were trying to pick who the bishops would be, and the Pope was saying, no, only the church who could pick, pick what the bishops were. And he took the side of the church because he was a church man, and that got him in trouble with some of these kings. But eventually the Pope ends up winning that one. Um, but anyhow, Anselm, as a person, lived a very moral life. He was devoted to truth and right living. He loved Christ. And in fact, I, I love this line of his. His most famous line is, I believe so that I may understand. See, skeptics wrongly hit it from the opposite point. They say, let me understand so I could believe. He's saying you can understand without first believing. And a lot of people are like, well, that's a priori. That is circular reasoning. But here's the thing. Everybody goes into everything. They, th they start with presuppositions is what I'm saying. Nobody just has a blank slate and then arrives at beliefs due to evidence and logical building. No, you start with the frame of interpretation. Everybody does. And everything that you learn is then interpreted through that. And so he caught that way before everybody else did. And so the atheist believes in materialism. They already say, well, we already believe naturalism. There's only matter and there can only be natural explanations for everything. And if you would say, how do you know that? They'd be like, the evidence, of course. No, the evidence doesn't point th that way one way or the other. They believe naturalism so they could understand everything that way. We believe theologically, so we could understand everything that way. So I love the fact that Anselm, uh, you know, captured that idea um, very early. Now his two most, or his two most important works are uh, Monologion and Proslogion. These both try to prove the existence of God by pure reason alone. And from this, we get the ontological argument. I know a lot of people don't like the ontological argument. It's probably not going to persuade a lot of people. Um, Thomas Aquinas will reject it later. But the ontological argument for the existence of God pretty much goes like this. It, it says, uh, in fact, I'll put it back up there. It says that God is the most perfect of all possible beings, logically. Can you think of anything more perfect than God? And once you think about everything the Bible tells us about God or everything we could even think about God, right, is there any perfection you could add to him? Is there any, can he be more infinite than infinite? 
It's impossible. Could he be more good than omnibenevolent? Could he be more everywhere than omnipresent? Uh, he couldn't. Could he be more just than perfectly just? So pretty much God is the sum of all perfections. Conceptually, you can't add anything to that. So he would say, but if God didn't exist, then he would not be the most perfect of all possible beings because a God that exists is more perfect than a God that doesn't exist. And so if God, by definition, is the sum of all perfections, existence is a perfection, therefore, by default, this concept that we believe is God must exist. In other words, in order to have the concept, he has to exist. How could we think he's the cap of our thinking? You can't think beyond God. Try to think of anything bigger, better, nicer, sweller, sweeter than God, more beautiful than God. You can't. He's the cap of every single category. And so what he would say is the fact that we can't get past that cap proves that he exists. Now, again, some people are like, no, it doesn't. I actually think it does. But again, it's because of my, my presuppositions. Um, but I like it. If God, by definition, is the most perfect of all possible beings, he must exist. And why, after all these thousands of years, have you, you have not been able to improve the concept of God? You just haven't. It's impossible. And so he exists. Now, again, a lot of people will be like, I don't think that's a valid argument. He's assuming what he's trying to prove. Um, so, yeah. Now, the thing that he's probably even, well, not more famous to the world, but more famous to the church for, is a book called Curdeus, uh, Curdeus Homo, which means Why the God-Man, um, where he sets a systematic theology of the atonement, of why Jesus died on the cross. You ask the average Christian out there, why did Jesus have to die for you? They can't tell you why. They could just tell you the what. Well, he died so I could be saved. Yeah, but why? Well, because I needed to be saved. Why? Well, because I'm a sinner. Okay, but how does him dying take care of your sin? He didn't sin. Well, because uh, it says he, he rose on the third day. What? That didn't even answer my question. You know, so people could keep giving the what, but hardly anybody ever thinks about the why. And Anselm, as a true scholastic, is like, no, we have to answer the why. And so pretty much he, this has had a very long lasting impact on Western theology. Now remember, people were thinking what Origen taught before this, that Jesus died as a ransom to Satan, that with the fall, somehow Satan became our owner. So God had to make a payment to Satan through the blood sacrifice of Christ. By making that payment, it rescues us from Satan. Um, but again, Satan would have never agreed. So he had to be tricked into it. So the idea is here, I'll give you the son of God. He's yours. You could kill him. And then Satan's like, that's way better than captive humanity. God's a fool. He gave me his only son. And then he kills the son and then the son raises indestructible. Satan's like, I've been tricked, you know, and then hum captive humanity is set free. If you want to see this played out, Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a ransom to Satan. Uh, he, he held this view. And if you watch even the movie with uh, Liam Neeson Aslan, it is the perfect depiction of the ransom to Satan thing. The, the white witch gets tricked into, uh, you know, like Edmund or whatever, the, the, the kid who sold out his family for those Turkish delights, which aren't even that good. I mean, that movie made me want to eat them. And when I ate them, I'm like, he sold his family out for that. But anyhow, uh, so he is owned because of his treachery by this evil person. So the lion is given uh, to her to free him. And then she thinks she wins by killing him. But then the little drop in his ear brings him back. And then, you know, it just, it all works against her. Well, anyhow, Anselm's like, that cannot be true. Okay. The fact of the matter is Satan has no rights to us. He's a robber and an outlaw. He's unjustly seized us as captive. Christ did not die as a ransom to Satan. Christ died as a ransom to God. Now, why is he a ransom to God? It, it, it's, it's pretty simple. It's the fact is this. God is outraged by our sin. It, it, God is outraged because he has honor, he has majesty, and we've rebelled against him. Therefore, the human race has two options. They either must suffer punishment for outraging God, or we must offer compensation. The technical word is satisfaction. We either take the punishment or we offer satisfaction. If we could pay him enough, then God's wrath is satisfied and we would not have to suffer. The problem is none of us could offer a compensation big enough to meet the outrage because God is eternal and infinite. Therefore, his outrage is infinite. But you're not infinite. So you can never give him anything that would be as worth as much as his outrage. 
So it would have to be of infinite value. So really only God can make this payment. Since God is merciful, since uh, he has willed to save sinners, he then determined that the satisfaction would be made by something that does have infinite value himself. So Jesus, as God, becomes a man and makes the payment to God on our behalf. That is the satisfaction theory of the atonement. Now, we accept a lot of ideas from this, but nobody just holds this like he did because Anselm was looking at it through the lens of feudalism, that you have a noble lord, and if you outrage that lord, you could compensate him with payment. And so he saw it completely in that sense. Now, again, a lot of truth in what he's saying here, but, but the fact of the matter is this. Uh, that that there's he's leaving out substitution and and i'll get to that in a second um christ never sinned right so god's not outraged christ uh, at christ christ's death was not due to anything he did because he's sinless that is why he could freely surrender his life on the cross to the father in return god then rewards christ for his self-sacrifice by applying the infinite worth of christ's merit to all the elect those that God chose from the beginning or foundation of the world. And again, as a reformed fella, I like that. And again, there's a lot of uh, a lot in this theory that shaped the classic Western Christian understanding of Christ's death. But again, here's the problem. He did not believe Jesus suffered the punishment of sin. Instead, he said all Jesus did was pay. He was an infinite compensation. He just paid for the outrage to make the outrage go away. It's like giving, you know, you rob me and you steal something precious to me and I'm a noble Lord. You know, if you make it worth my while and you give me something that makes me forget what you took from me, I'm like, all right, we're cool. You know, and that's kind of like Christ's value is so much bigger than our sin than God could be like, oh, I'm cool with it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus was a substitute for our sin, modeled off the animal sacrifices where our sin is passed on to the animals. And even though they didn't sin, they die for our sin. Jesus, our sin was placed on him. So he died not just as a satisfaction, but as a substitutionary satisfaction. That's what we add to Anselm to make it right. Um, so anyhow, good argument. And, and the way he, the, his idea of the atonement really does shaped the way we think about it today, just with those additions that I, I gave right there. His argument, the reason why I bring this up, because mainly everything I just said is what you would get in a systematic theology class. Uh, you get a shorter explanation in a, in a church history class. But the reason I, I bring this up here is because it proves that this is, this is what scholastics do. Okay? It wasn't good enough just to know that Christ died for us. He wanted to know why. Why did salvation happen this way and not another way? Why couldn't it have just been through good works? Why couldn't it have been through this or that? And so he's answering that question with these deep questions, and he does a really good job. Um, so, yeah. You know what? What I'll do is I'll stop here. I wanted to go to Peter Abelard and then uh, uh, Peter Lombard and then Sacramental Theology, but we're already at 817. So um, what I'll do is I'll just... We'll stop with Anselm. I just have to remember that we only got to Anselm. And then next week, uh, or two weeks from now, we'll jump uh, to Peter Abelard. So with that, uh, Luke is...